Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another episode. How would you feel to find out that your financial planner, your financial coach, your financial therapist faced bankruptcy five times in their life? (laughs) Hopefully, before you wrote them off, you would say, tell me more. I don't know if any of you saw this a few months back, but I did a interview with uh, Maury Stenner for Market Watch. And he had called me and said, you know, I listened to a podcast you did with Michael Kitsis. And it was actually the first one in, in Michael's series, and that was years ago. And I remember Michael said, Rick, I, I want to hear about all your challenges, your trials, the things you did wrong, not what you've done right. I said, well, that's not going to be a problem. So we did that interview, and and I still get remarks on it today because I think it's a little bit different professionally to show our vulnerabilities versus here's everything that I've done right. I think I've said before I had a train the trainer when I was in real estate who told me a nugget that I've never forgotten. He said, when you're speaking to people, don't tell them everything you've done right, how great you are, all of your successes. Tell them all your warts. <laughs> tell them all your mistakes. Because then they'll relate to that because you're just like them. So I, I did this interview with Maureen. He wanted me to tell him or talk about business failures. And I said, well, I can do that. <laughs> I've, I've had plenty. I've actually faced bankruptcy five times in in my career. So we had a nice discussion, maybe talked about a half hour. And then a few days later, I started getting the um, Google alerts. And this was originally published at marketwatch.com. And the headline was, we're really glad you made all these mistakes. This financial planner uses his five near bankruptcies to help clients manage risk. That was uh, originally published July 18th of 2022. And when I read that thing, I'm like, OMG. Uh, It left me wondering if I didn't know this person who was me. What? (laughs) Are they worth anything? (laughs) Are they living hand to mouth? Uh, Five times. And I mean, it's true. I've lightheartedly told clients on a lot of occasions that I've made a number of business mistakes and gone into the, the, the mistakes that I've made when appropriate and pointed out that the value of me making a lot of mistakes is that this way I can tell you what to avoid. And uh, I, I remember a client saying that to me, saying, well, I'm glad you made all these, these mistakes. This, this must be your value add to us. And there is a guiding principle in my financial planning firm, and I I think I've mentioned it on the podcast before. I don't know. But it's the idea that we lose Rick's money first, which basically means we don't put a client in an investment that we're not willing to own ourselves. It's akin to a financial therapist doing their own work. It's akin to a financial therapist having a therapist and, and having done therapy that if a financial planner or an investment advisor holds the same investments that they're advising clients on, I think it says a lot about the integrity. It's uh, like a cook eating their own cooking. It's somewhat 
similar to an old adage of having skin in the game. So I do try to be vulnerable, open, transparent with my clients, whether they're financial planning clients or financial therapy clients. Vulnerability, I could be a little bit off on this, but it it seemed to me like the number one trait of really successful CEOs was emotional intelligence, which also dealt with their willingness and ability to be vulnerable. And I think in being vulnerable, there's an inherent ability that 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 means you you're aware, you're aware of your vulnerabilities, and to some degree have made peace with them, to some degree have accepted them, to some degree feel confident in your skin, and by that maybe I mean confident in your humanity because there is there is a humility in an embracing our humanity. And I may have mentioned before on the podcast that a long time ago I discovered that humility didn't feel like what I thought it was. There's kind of a, I don't know, just a, a big acceptance in that. And vulnerability, you know, Brené Brown talks a lot about it. When you get done listening to Brené Brown talk about vulnerability, you're like, yeah, I want to go be vulnerable. And then you go be vulnerable. (laughs) And we rediscover why (laughs) we aren't, uh, vulnerability is not easy. And I think that's what I ran into when I read this story of being vulnerable And it's one thing to tell a client one-to-one that you've had business blow-ups or you've faced bankruptcy five times. But it's another thing when you put it out for the whole world. And that was a part of me that recoiled, like, oh, my God, what are people going to think of you? And part of that reaction is actually doing this podcast Because I wanted to lean into that, and I wanted to lean into the fear, the triggering of some of my vulnerable parts over sharing my vulnerability. So the one thing that I do wish had been written, and I, I don't know if I told Maury this or not in the interview. It really doesn't matter, but it's the rest of the story wasn't in that interview. And I think it's an important part of the story because part of the story is that I faced bankruptcy five times and every time I didn't go bankrupt and that's part of me is fearful that when somebody reads that it'll get morphed into I actually went bankrupt. And going bankrupt is not something that's very good for a certified financial planner. (laughs) You can lose your rights to use the CFP marks if you go bankrupt. So between that and the idea that it might leave the impression that I'm a relatively broke financial planner, and I don't know, I, I don't want my financial planner to be broke. I don't want my financial therapist to be broke. That would be like my dietician being extremely overweight, I think. So I'd like my professionals to uh, eat their own cooking. I'd like my professionals, if somebody is telling me how to do something, I want them to be a master of what they're telling me to do. I want them to have done their own work. So I think it all, all comes full circle. So What I didn't say or what wasn't written in that article was that those five bad business decisions and and some were investment decisions spanned about 40 years of my business career when uh, where I owned multiple businesses and I have a part of me that's a serial innovator and very entrepreneurial. I did a lot of businesses. They all were related to money finance, except for one, (laughs) which 
did not do well, lost 75% of its value in the first six months of my partner and I operating it. It was in the hardwood basketball or gym court floor business. And I also didn't explain that making bad decisions, bad financial decisions is normal for individuals that build significant wealth. There was a book called The Middle Class Millionaire by Russ Prince and Lewis Schiff that was published in 2008. And they noted that the average millionaire made 3.1 major career or business mishaps versus 1.6 mistakes for non-millionaires. And, and I've brought that stat out before. So it's somewhat normal. It kind of goes with the territory when you're an entrepreneur. And the other thing that I didn't say or what wasn't written is that despite my five near bankruptcies, I've been successful enough in my business ventures and investments that I could have retired at age 57. I continue to work, not because I need the income, but because I really love and enjoy what I do. So I think the difference in those that succeed in building wealth and fail so many times, make makes you know significant bad decisions, <clears throat> is that they try again and again. And there's a persistence. There is a learning that can come from making mistakes. And probably for every really bad financial decision I made, I probably have made five good ones. There uh, needs to be a learning. And a, a lot of that learning can be a deeper awareness and a deepening of emotional intelligence. And I wrote in my first book, Conscious Finance, about, I think it was my last near brush, the uh, baseball court floor fiasco, of how I spent a whole weekend letting the thoughts go and the feelings be. I mean, just feeling the deep fear around everything it's going to take for me to dig out of this, all of the financial loss that was going to incur, the assets I was going to have to sell to pay off the debt. I, I remember a whole weekend of just really laying on the floor, just feeling that pain. And it was also around the time that I was doing the work with George Kinder in the seven stages of money maturity workshop and learning to actually, actually feel feelings. And part of the reason of feeling a feeling is to process it, to finish it, to let it pass. Because on the other side of a difficult feeling is typically lightness and clarity. And I remember the clarity that came. It was like Monday morning, I woke up and I was clear as a bell as to what needed to be done. I wrapped the whole thing up rather than continuing. And at that time, my partner wanted to continue and was ready to go back at it. And I was just so clear, let's shut it down, take the losses. And that's not a decision I would have normally made. But I was just so clear with processing all of the feelings of failure and insignificance and fear. So from those, those failures, you know, I had to call on resourcefulness to dig out of the situation, to minimize losses, pay off the debts, and then uh, carry on, learn and carry on. So my business mistakes gave me a chance to do things differently. They gave me a chance... Uh, to look at money scripts, money burdens that weren't serving me well. Uh, you know, like one of those money scripts may be, well, if you own real estate, you can't go wrong. <laughs> and I discovered very experientially what one of my real estate instructors once told me. He said, you know, in the end of the day, you'll always come out on top with real estate. In the long run, you'll always do okay. The problem is you got to be around for the long run. 
meaning you've got to be able to survive the inevitable blow-ups that come. My business failures gave me opportunities to feel how paralyzing a business mistake can be. How difficult it can be just to keep going, to put one foot in front of the other. And I remember just how small I felt compared with successful business people in my community. One day, I was one of those successful business people, and within 30 days, sometimes it felt like overnight, I was very unsuccessful, and I owed banks and people money, and I was having to sell off assets to uh, pay those debts back, and I just remember how small I felt in comparing myself, and yeah, it's not a very good thing to compare ourselves, but I did. And I remember even feeling small and inadequate after one business failure when I compared myself to one of my employees. And at the time, they were more secure, more financially stress-free, and had a greater net worth than I did. So just... uh aware of of those vulnerable parts that um, I felt being successful was um, so important to being accepted. Parts that just feared that I wouldn't be able to provide for myself, for my family. And I remember one really tough time was in the mid-80s. In Rapid South Dakota, we have a Air Force Base called Ellsworth Air Force Base. And the B-52 bomber was relocated from Ellsworth to make way for the B-1 bomber to come in. Problem is they mistimed it. And to the best of my recall, we had about two years of 25% vacancies in town because I think three, four, five thousand 5,000 people left with the B-52. So I had some uh, rental houses, and I was pretty leveraged. I mean, I was kind of like your typical real estate investor. If I got any cash, I used it to buy a house. So I didn't have a lot of cash reserves. I was highly leveraged. And I remember if all my rental houses were full, it cost me $1,500 a month out of my salary to make all of my mortgage obligations and and expenses. And of course, with 25% vacancy rate, they weren't full all the time. And then that $1,500 a month was even higher when there were vacancies. And I remember during that time, just feeling so paralyzed, like I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. I remember the struggle And I learned not to look at my balance sheet because, or my income statements, because if I looked at them, I'd be frozen with fear. And if I'm frozen with fear, I'm not out talking to prospects. I'm not out creating business. So the way that I dealt with that is I exiled a part of myself that was so fearful, just didn't want to go to the possibility of what this meant. And I was so afraid of being overwhelmed by this paralyzing fear that my managers just exiled that part of myself. So for literally about 20 years, I didn't look at my balance sheet or my income statement, especially my income statement, because I didn't want, didn't want to feel that fear so The manager parts of me made sure that we didn't look at the income statement. And I really remember very succinctly, it is probably, you know, early 2000s when I started doing my own money work and I decided, you know what, it's time to really face that and um, take a look at that, take a look at my income statement. And I remember when I did, you know, I got all the numbers together and I remember the fear and trepidation of looking. 
And when I did, I, I was kind of amazed that I wasn't losing 1500 a month or more, but I actually had a positive cash flow of 5000 a month. And that makes sense because some of these properties were getting ready to uh, pay off. I had owned for quite a while. That's just a, a little bit of what I wanted to to share with you. And I think it makes sense that a person that does fail so many times, they they bring out that one of the a commonality of a lot of people who become millionaires or more today, and probably multimillionaires, that they own their own business or they have ownership of the business they work in. And I think that also adds an extra motivation of having skin in the game because it really ramps up the responsibility, right? I think that is also a significant factor in the rebounding and the resiliency. So I've probably compounded my fear of vulnerability by sharing all this in the podcast. It's not about the money, is it? It's about looking at those money scripts. And boy, it sure gives you an opportunity when you fail, when you fail financially, to take a look under the hood, to take a look at what's going on and really learn from that. And I am I'm really uh, thankful and grateful that somehow within me, there has been that knowledge or that characteristic of let's learn from this and not do it again. So that's what I wanted to share with you this week. I want to thank all of you that do email me, reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook Messenger, wherever you do to share with me what the uh, podcast it means to you. And um, it really, as I told somebody today, I responded to it. It means so much to to know, uh, like somebody reached, told me recently, you know, this particular article changed my life, changed the direction of my life. And that's so encouraging to me because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't making a difference if nobody cared and nobody found any value in it. And while I enjoy what I'm doing, I love what I'm doing, I still have the need to make a difference. I still have the need to be heard, be seen. And that just really helps when, when I, I know that it's, it's of value to somebody. Thanks for tuning in. And again, you can reach out to me at rick at rickkaler.com. Let me know what's on your mind because, you know, I'm talking with people's where I, I get ideas for the podcast. And so far, I've had enough ideas to fill over a year and a half of podcasting. One of these days, I'll probably run out of ideas and things to say. But so far, they keep popping up. So, all right, take care, and I look forward to being with you next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.